Um, this morning, John Huff and I, Jim Stoudemire, are going to uh, talk a little bit about using three-phase equipment in the home shop. And the first question is, what is three-phase? Probably everybody knows that as good as I do, but um, if you can see that, that top, top view is 110. That's what the current looks like in 110. You might remember that from uh, high school, if you can remember back that far. And the second one is 220, where you have two different um, waveforms exactly opposite. Well, the third one down here, and it's not a real good drawing, but that's, that's three phase, where there's three hot wires. Uh, most of us don't have three phase available to our shop, so that's what we're going to be talking about a little bit this morning. Um, this, this machine came, came from an auction, and uh, John and I were going to talk a little bit about if you go to an auction, what, what do you look like look at? Um, John, you want to stuff, hit some of those stuff. points? <laughs> yeah, yeah well, so, in, so you go uh, either on the internet or you go to an auction and you see a, a piece of machinery sitting there and it, and it says, uh, you know, it looks like something you might be interested in. And you look at the tag, you check out the motor tag real quick and it says, you know, three horsepower, and then you see three phase and you figure, nah, I don't want to deal with it because that's just too much trouble. Um, but um, you might want to take a second thought on that. And as you start to look at the machine, the first thing you probably want to do is you know, give the motor a spin and see whether or not it actually rotates. <coughs> um, if, even, if it's, uh, even if it's a little coarse or something, if, if it's just a bearing issue, you know, you, you might want to give some consideration to keeping it because, or to, to buying it because it, it uh, bearings aren't terribly difficult to, to change, uh, just a matter of opening a motor up. And most three-phase motors, uh, 110 can get a little tricky in opening them up because they have switches and things in there that change your windings. But on three-phase, you don't have those internal switches and things. So um, that's something you want to uh, keep in mind is the bearing issues are, are relatively minor for a three-phase motor. Um, also, you want to check and uh, if you can, if there's any vent holes, this one, the vents are on the bottom. But if you can't get your nose in there and take a sniff, a sniff test works really well with the motor because if it's burnt, you can tell. I mean, you can smell the, a burnt winding. Uh, bearings don't trouble me as much as, or a stiff, you know, stiff shaft, and that doesn't uh, trouble me as much as a burnt odor. Um, there's a, you know, if you're looking at a, a piece of equipment and it's, you know, it looks like it's been dropped off the back of a truck, you probably ought to, you might, you might want to consider passing on that. So obvious signs of damage like dents and bent shafts and things like that are probably a little out of the range of, you know, what your average uh, homeowner wants to do in terms of uh, restoration. But uh, if you're also, if you're, if you can get a chance to look at some of the wiring and stuff, and this is, uh, this is a good example of, of wiring that's pretty worn. You see some of the threads, there's some tape in here and, and uh, you can see some junctions have been tied on. But if you'll notice, these are all, all these wires are fairly flexible. If you get one that's been over volted and burnt, these wires will get crispy. And I, that, that doesn't mean you, that's an absolute no, but that'd be a warning sign to me. Um, I've, I have found some things with crispy <coughs> wires that you can repair, but, uh, but that's something you want to be real careful about. And the price ought to reflect, you know, any damage like that that you find. So uh, in terms of just a, a quick, you know, quick over view, that, that's kind of, some of the key points you want to hit. And also, I'd be a little, uh, I'd be nervous of shiny stuff. You know, stuff that's been clearly, you know, slash painted real quick. If you see lots of overspray, this this is a pretty typical of industrial equipment that gets, you know, they have an annual shop cleanup day and they get out there with a paintbrush and, and paint away. But if you have something that's been uh, shined up and, you know, clearly put out for sale, that's something you want to take an extra, a little extra time to, to look it over closely. But very often, you know, ratty looking stuff like this uh, can come at a great price and, and can be a great addition to the shop, so. Yeah, one, one thing <clears throat> that uh, I always look at in addition to that is there's a, there's a motor plate on here and it'll tell you the voltage. Uh, this one's 22440 probably. Yeah, 22440. Which is good. If you get one that says 380 or just 440 by itself, or even what do you have earned 580 or something, 
you're 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 talking about a lot more expense than getting that running in your shop. I don't I don't have anything that's 440 only. I I all the stuff in this shop has been uh, rewired to two, 220, 240, whatever you want to call it. So um, one thing you got to consider when you, when you're buying this equipment is moving it safely. This this one's not too bad. John and I could. Uh, lift this one up by ourselves if we had to. Some of the three-phase equipment you'll get is going to be heavy, so uh, you have to plan. That's one of the considerations when you buy it. How are you going to get it home? Um, it's called Jim. Yeah. <laughs> but you, 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 you'll need, sometimes you'll need equipment like a, um, a an engine, thanks guys, an engine, uh, an engine hoist or a, a pallet jack or a trailer. Um, John and I went to pick one up. It was advertised as being uh, 86, 80, yeah, whatever it was. It was advertised being less than eight foot. And we showed up with an eight foot trailer and they hadn't measured it exactly right. So we had to borrow some planks to lay in the trailer so that the front legs could be in the trailer and the back ones were hanging a foot off the back of the trailer just sitting on the plank but you'll, you'll need a way to tie it down and you have to remember some of us just can't lift 200 pounds anymore you got to unless you want to pay for it for the next week or so yeah. you, you need some friends so um, there you want to talk about why why you would even want to buy a three-phase piece of equipment Duh. yeah that's good that's a good point uh, I'd say uh, probably the, the biggest reason you want to do is durability uh, and, uh, and basic reliability. It's, it's uh, stuff that was built you know, to run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, it's some of the toughest industrial machines you'll ever find. Um, if it can put up with uh, that kind of stuff, there's nothing you can do to it in a short period of time that, uh, that you'll have it that, that uh, will wear something like that out. So I think that's probably the... the uh, the key issue with three phase. The other part is, is when you go to an auction, <coughs> two of the things that kind of start to lower price when you when you go to a general auction, if it's a 110 volt piece of machinery, that goes premium price. If it's 220, the price starts to come down. If it's three phase, it comes way down. It usually cuts by you know half from 110 to 220, and 220 to three phase drops it even further. So price is a big issue when you're when you're looking at uh, uh, three phase equipment at, at auction anyway. Um, and I think another, uh, aside from you know it being inexpensive, uh, and this is a good, I think my lathe is a good example of that. Is that you know we went found that blunt lathe and that was a three phase, which scared me away from it initially. But the, the other thing that got me was the the weight of the item. So uh, weight can be a negative, but it can also be a real positive, especially you know when you're talking about vibration. So vibrations in machinery transmit to the product that you're doing. You know, it doesn't matter if it's a table saw or if it's a lathe, you're gonna get that trans that vibration will transfer through the product that you're producing on it. So heavier is better uh, in that in that regard. Um, you also get a larger capacity generally speaking. Um, you know most lathes are, are 12 inch, most industrial lathes start at 12 and get bigger. So uh, same thing with saws uh, you know you have 10 inches generally your average on a saw but as you start getting into the industrial stuff, you start getting into 12, 14, 16 inch saws, and those are, those are incredible. Um, <clears throat> it also means that, that uh, when you get into the three phase equipment, since you have three wires going in, the wires don't have to be as big for the amperage that you're having. So if you have, uh, if you have a, uh, let's say a two horsepower, three horsepower, 10 inch table saw that's a, running on 110, you're looking at you know, somewhere like 18 amps. If, you're, if you have that same saw in three phase, you really split that by three, so you can divide that. You're at six amps per wire, so your wire size can go down to that six amp thing instead of the total 18 amp, which would require some much heavier cabling. So, um, and, and additionally, they also run cooler than a 110, so those are some of the Oh, that, the that cool was your... Yeah, oh, I wish that was cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm yeah, that uh, heat off, dude. <laughs> I, I just did back yeah, here. Um, the um, of course, there's all, if there's pluses, there's negatives, and the first negative 
is is fear. People just get scared when they hear the word three phase. But a lot of us have three phase equipment in our shop right now and don't realize it. Um, your big power Maddox, Jets, Grizzly, this uh, VB, uh, the Robust, they all have three phase motors in them. Now they're not advertised as three phase because they've got a variable frequency drive which we'll talk about in a minute but they are they are three phase i was looking at that robust this morning yesterday afternoon i don't remember which the motor plate is way down underneath where it's hard to see because they don't want people oh that's three phase i don't want to buy that but you get down there that's a three phase motor and it's got a variable frequency drive on it so that you can just plug it into to 220 and that's where we're headed with this today but there, there's a couple um, there's different ways to convert, and we'll talk about that, but one of the things we said before, a negative is a weight. They're going to be heavier. They're going to take up more space. Um, I don't know if you guys can, can see this little grinder, grinder here. Some of you can. It's an eight-inch grinder. That's what most of us would have as a bench grinder in our shop, uh, traditionally. If you look behind uh, Joe there, that grinder is a little bigger it's going to take up more space the um, the wheels are going to instead of getting a wheel for 10 or 12 dollars you're talking one to two hundred dollars a wheel if you buy them new so you get you got more expense in in that kind of stuff and the other thing if you go to change those wheels you're not going to do it with your standard uh, 3 8 inch socket set you're going to have to have some bigger tools which in my mind, that, that's not a negative. I'd like buying tools anyhow. But uh, uh, So there's some things. Uh, there are some negatives to them. But we've, got, we've got several options on, on, on taking this. This is a three-phase two, 220 sander. And the options we have on uh, changing this over, one is a rotary phase converter, which that's what I use in this shop. Um, I've, I've got wired and uh, back in the back if we can reach it with the, that. Now I've got live three phase throughout my shop. If you're going to have a lot of machines, that's the way to go. Um, because it's, it's one, one expense and you're not spending $100 a piece to put a variable frequency drive on. Um, the uh, second option is a variable frequency drive, and that's, we've got, we've got one right here, and those of you that's got a Jetter, Powermatic, and does, does Grizzly hang theirs on the outside? Yeah. So you, you might have seen something like that. That's what, it, yeah. that's what they look like. I hmm, wonder what those two wires get to. <laughs> um, an another option is uh, change the motor. If Lee's probably not happy with that option, but uh, if you can get a, something like a bandsaw or a lathe or a drill press that, that has a standard size motor in, and you can find a, a 220 or 110 volt motor with the same frame size. Frame size will give you the mounting pattern. It also gives you the shaft size. It gives you the distance from the mounting pattern to the shaft. So if you hit the same frame size, you're going to be able to just take one out and put the other one in which is, is a, a good, good uh, thing. You might have to change the switches and stuff to, to match single phase instead of uh, three phase, but that's a good choice. And for those people that are lucky enough to live where three phase is available, which it's not here. I don't know if anybody has it uh, available. At their, do you have three phase at your, from the street, Nelson? Wait, no. no. I mean, that, that's, a, that's an option too. Uh, my neighbor had a little shop and uh, three phase is about three quarters of a mile. And uh, 
I think they wanted $15,000 to run the wire to him. That was 30 years ago. So that kind of puts it out of my price range. Um, in, th in this shop here, we have, uh, I have a number of machines that are running on, on three phase. And uh, I think the number is eight uh, of these different machines you see throughout the shop are three phase. Plus, there's three in here that are three phase with the VFD built into them. This, this lathe, the robust, and a little tool we'll look at later, uh, a sander that we, we made. So that, that's, um, that's why we went that way in this shop as far as the, the uh, rotary phase converter. But this one, most, a lot of people are just going to have one or two machines, in which case the VFD is the best choice for a couple reasons. First, it's quick, easy, and relatively inexpensive, and the V part is variable. What that means is that it's going to, this is running, it's six, is designed for 60 cycles, which is what we, we've got in the U.S., and the variable frequency drive will vary the number of cycles. So if it puts it at uh, 30 cycles, this machine's going to run half speed. If it puts it at 120 cycles, it's going to run double speed. So you can, uh, you've got a big choice here. What, what I do, <coughs> first thing I like to do, and it's not an option for everybody, I think we did it with your lathe, is before you put a lot of time and money in it, let's just see if it works. Um, and you can do this even before you buy your variable frequency drive. If you've got a friend with a, um, a rotary phase converter. And what I'm going to do right, what I'm going to do now is just hook, hook this guy up to uh, a little switch I have here. And we're going to test it to see if it do does in fact work. Oh, I hope it doesn't hum. controller we're, we're almost the limit of my reaching the so we get, we've got it hooked up um, and I'm just going to turn this on and off to make sure you're ready John yep. well, that good. <laughs> <Let it> run, <laughs> so I see yeah, your switch is on. You well, that switch, Joe, um, I've got it disconnected. Oh, okay. I, I took the switch out of the circuit for two reasons. First, just to save us some time this morning. And second, most variable frequency drives recommend that you don't switch the current coming out of them. That if you want to switch them, you switch the current going into them. So that, that's why that is uh, like that. All right. Well, there's something we didn't talk about was the advantage of a variable frequency drive in terms of the type of machine that you're using. So if you're putting it on, say you bought a three-phase drill press, you know, that gives you, instead of changing your belts for your speeds, uh, it allows you to change the speed based on the drill bit that you're using. So instead of just doing the, you know, the each cutting tool has a feet per minute, so instead of just going with a, you know, an average, which is what a four-speed pulley would be or a nine-speed pulley setup would be, um, you can dial it right into the exact increment that the drill bit calls for. So you could, and the same thing is with a bandsaw. You go variable speed in the bandsaw. If you're into metal working, you know that that works. And for sanding, feet per minute is important too. So if you're, uh, you'd have to get into a little bit of the literature that the abrasive companies send out. But um, lots of them will recommend a, a specific like 1,200 feet per minute for their particular belts. So if you're running a 
you know, 3450 RPM motor with a, uh, with a straight uh, belt right off that, you're getting, you might be getting it somewhere in that 6,000 feet per minute belt range. And at that point, you're burning wood very quickly. So if you've ever burned wood on a, on a uh, belt sander or uh, belt a, you know, turned a bit blue on your, on your drill press, that might be because you're, you're running either too fast or... or and you're talking also 110. Uh, or not, no, no, no. no. Uh, you, you can't put a variable frequency drive on a, on 110. Uh, really? That's the sad part of it. That, unless it's a, I think there's some DC motors that you can do that with. That's the only thing I'm aware of. That and universal motors can be done with variable speed. But uh, generally speaking, the only one that can run is uh, old three phases off of frequency drives. Yeah, the way they control speed on other ones. Of course, we remember the step belts that mm -hmm. many ladies had. There's also a Reeves drive, which is variable width pulleys that uh, uh, we've got one in here. I know the other people have them. Uh, Lee, that's what, that's on your Grizzly. It's got a uh, Reeves drive. Uh, that yeah. they're, they're much uh, they're noisier and you yeah. know, get a lot of vibration to transmit. Yeah, I showed uh, Larry Whitmer my Jet Lee. Yeah. Okay, as we said, this, this is a variable frequency drive, and they come with a, a manual that if you're not going to do anything special, is pretty easy to follow. I, I was having trouble uh, <clears throat> getting the right settings on this one, and the, the, what language is the manual written in? Chinese uh, uh, or something. <laughs> Chinglish, I think, English. or something. And um, it just doesn't read well. So I looked on the internet, and the first first two people that I uh, that I looked at said the manual's great. It's got everything you need. And then you watched what they do, and they hooked the input and the output wires up and flipped a switch. Well, yeah, it's great for that. If you want to program it, which is not a, it's not difficult as long as once you understand it, there these are programmable for a number of functions. You can program your speed. You can put preset speeds in it. You can program. Uh, did you notice when we shut this off, it just drifted down? We're going to, this one's going to be programmed to break it, so it'll stop it quicker. You can program the ramp up speed, the ramp down speed. Uh, if you're going to do great big bowls on a lathe, you normally don't want it to break real quick, yeah. unless you've got your chuck lock to the spindle real good, because you can just break it and there's yep. a number of us that have yeah. have tried that you yeah, had a great big metal and me eight inch chuck coming yeah. yeah right off the end of that right off the end of the uh, spindle so i can get dicey on your toes if <laughs> you're not saying it so there's a, a number of ways you can put a remote control box this has a removable control box you can put an extension cord on and and mount this little panel somewhere you can control it all from everything from this panel what we're going to do today is we're going to uh, wire this up and we're going to uh, put a, a remote switch in it. That's what these two little little pigtails are for. And I think on price point on these things, the cheaper the, the cheaper the VFD, generally the, the uh, less interpretable the instructions. So the more expensive ones get better manuals, they have better instructions, they have better customer support. And there's just a, a wide range of price in uh, VFDs. And, I think that was like a seventy-five dollar one. They can go as low as like sixty bucks, all the way up to about four hundred. So, depending on the horsepower and stuff. But there, a lot of the price uh, has to do with uh, the instruction manuals, uh, how readable they are. Is there a brand that's more preferable than others? Uh, you know, no. I there's a, a club, a, a website called Old, Wood, Old Woodworking Machine. They tend to like Teco uh, and uh, Automation Nation. So we're not but they're uh, uh, they're the guys that they tend to recommend the most. I've never used them, so I, I really don't. I can't speak from personal experience, but they seem to get a lot of uh, press, you know, and, and uh, people seem to be pleased with them. So uh, um, I don't. There are some American companies uh, that make uh, variable frequency drives, and some of those get pretty pricey. Um, I think. I, the one that's on my lathe, the big uh, blunt lathe, is a, a KDAC, so that's a KD Electronics out of Florida, and uh, of course they're manufactured in the U.S., so all their instructions are in the U.S. and their tech support is U.S. based. So if you're having, you know, if you're, um, I, 
guess a little, uh, if you're new to all that stuff, you know, the better tech support you get, the easier it is. Uh, and some of them are very programmable like this one, and then others are less programmable that are marketed more for the farm market and uh, uh, some of those kinds of things. That's how I got into the thing was through a, uh, one of these Mennonite electric shops that uh, you know, does conversions for farm equipment and restaurant equipment. And they're big selling points, so it's like farmers don't want to mess with you know, having to work through all these different functions and stuff. They just want to plug it in and kind of use it. So they, instead of using programmable stuff, they use jumpers. jumpers. No, it's just, I guess, if, if you're a programmer, that's very familiar. If you're a mechanical kind of guy, jumpers are more familiar. You know, so they market you know, to their, I guess, to their customers, so that makes good sense. Depends on, it really depends on, uh, I guess, your budget. If you're unfamiliar with it, the jumper wire stuff, it's easier to deal with. But it, once you've done it once, uh, I have to say, it seems it's all very mysterious and everything. Once you've done it once, it's the basic issue is two wires in, three wires out. You know? So it's, it, it can't get any simpler than that. It's really hard to, it's really hard to mess it up. The, the biggest thing they say you can mess up is, is uh, putting the, the live wires in the output and the uh, output in the live wires. That's, yeah, that's bad. That's bad. <laughs> It, it will fry it immediately. I was very, I was intimidated by it, BFD the first time I went around. Like I said, that's one of the reasons I went with KBAC because they were, you know, less intimidating in this realm. But the, the truth is, they're they're fairly simple. I don't think it's beyond anybody's capability. You know, working through one of these things, and and uh, so I I've just in that amount of time mm -hmm. wired. We've got two two hot wires going in, three three coming out, and I've put this switch in in there. And uh, you clear? Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we always try to be as safe as possible. Okay. I just plugged it in, and I've got a uh, a display there, which I have no idea what it means. But we're going to turn this switch on and see if it turns on. Okay, that, that that's running in reverse. To change that for a three phase, all I have to do is change two of these leads and it, it changes the, the direction. Or, if I was so minded, I don't know if I can, okay. I've, I've got this plugged into a start forward, so it, it thinks it's going forward. I'd have to change two of the wires and it would be fine. But I can, uh, Adjust the speed, and I can stop it. You notice how quickly it stopped there. That's got got the brake on. So right right now, I've got a usable machine, and the things I did with the what they call the programming was these come. Uh, most countries in the world use 50 cycles, and these are all these. Everyone that I've played with comes preset at 50. Uh, cycles per second. I change it to 60 and it asks you, there's an option on, do you want to control it with the keyboard here or do you want to control with an extra switch? You just hit the option for the extra switch, wire, wire the switch in and you've got a usable three-phase machine. Uh, yeah, John was saying the price, th this one uh, there's, there's a couple things that affect the price. You were talking about American made. That really affects the price. Uh, the other one, the bigger units you get, the more, in general, the more money. There are some exceptions to that because they've got three horsepower ones now are cheaper than two horsepower ones, and it's probably due to the volume. But the important thing is the amperage. This one is good for uh, eight amp 
and this motor draws 8.4 and that's close enough for me if it draws over 8 amp this this will uh, shut it off it acts as a motor protection which supersedes your uh, um, a lot of a lot of uh, machines three phase what I've got have a um, heater what's called a heater it's a little fuse in it that, that protects your motor you size that to the motor this you size the motor too since it's eight eight amp and this is about eight amp I just left it go at the um, the overload protection at 100 percent if I was to use this unit on a motor that only drew four amps I'd reset that to 50 percent and then I've got the motor protected our our fuse boxes or circuit breakers they're designed to protect the wiring in the shop or the house. They, your wiring, um, depending on the gauge, you have a maximum breaker size you can use, which in this case, I'm running a lot bigger equipment than this off my three phase. That band saw is seven and a half horsepower as opposed to three. So the wires are sized so I can run that band saw and that circuit breaker is not gonna kick off on this machine until it's already fried so that's that's why you like to have the additional protection so this gives you variable frequency drive motor protection um, your braking power and this unit um, when i bought it it was about a hundred dollars i think you can get them now for somewhere around seventy dollars and uh, the other thing was that one's set this one's a 220 input uh, BFD and most of them are 220 input but uh, there are some 110 input ones so you know that's another thing to keep in mind is that they're a little rare and I, uh, and oddly I think they're a little bit more expensive but um, uh, usually the, the correlation is the higher the amperage that you're drawing so the bigger the horsepower the more expensive the VFD so if you're in a three-quarter horsepower range in that or one horsepower that's a price point that's in that you know less than 100 and below probably no less than 60 I'd say but that's that first step and then the you know up to probably two horsepower then you get close to 100 100 and a half if you get up to three horsepower that's where you start to get 250 350 into that range so the the bigger the horsepower the, well, you're, the more you're, expensive you're you're talking get. american price a made price just in general because well, this this one is a two horsepower okay for 70. yeah and you can get a three horsepower for just about the same price 60 63 64 dollars okay. um shop around because yeah. you just never know and so far I've been the input voltage is what I was trying to make yeah the, in, it, the input there voltage some 110 volt input uh, BFDs but they're they're not the norm okay anybody have some questions Vern have you been biting your tongue no. okay good I'm gonna draw it, check and before you put the power to it, throw everything to ground. Well, I, I did that. I didn't mention it, but I, I, I got a what's it wasn't a cheap ohm meter. I have a what's called a mega ohm meter, and uh, a mega ohm meter checks the motor insulation, and it, it's this this one checked out real real good. It it went off the scale at the high voltage, so I'm I'm good with that. That's a good point. Uh, that's something I didn't think about. But if you set one of those up, one thing you, you want to make sure you do, even though you're, you have a ground to, you know, your regular ground wire there, um, that's a, you can see it coming from the 220 in. So the green wire is a ground wire. Whenever you set a VFD with a motor, that's not enough ground for it. You need the ground. You need to bond that that unit to this motor because what VFDs do weird things with. Uh, frequency field and, and uh, there's some voltage bleed sometimes. I, the first one I set up, I, I was I had set it up, everything ran perfectly. I, you know, I was happy as could be. I'm running the lathe and I had I had my hand uh, uh, on, I think I had my hand on the tool rest and I reached over to do something and it just brushed the edge of the VFD case and um, I felt a tingle. <laughs> well I felt that tingle before and I kind of like <laughs> backed off and you know turned everything off and then I took an ohm meter on it and I was there was about 60 70 volts so it was running hot off the frame of the machine you and mean I, you I, took an ohm meter from what now oh uh, from ground to the case to the case okay. just to check to see you know where if there was any voltage there and there was it was hot so you know that really surprised me and then I started digging I thought oh I got a loose wire I opened the motor up you know I'm looking at all the wiring and stuff like that 
And as I dug around and uh, talked to some electricians and stuff, they said, you know, did you bond your VFD to the, to the machine? I said, well, no. <laughs> Why would I do that? It already had a ground wire there, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and the odd part was I had originally set up to do that. I had a pigtail set and everything. I just didn't do it. And I, I, I don't remember why I didn't do it, but after I set the ground there, and then I did the checks, you know, everything was clear. So if you do install one, make sure you bond that unit to your, to your frame so that everything is grounded and bonded. See, I, I have one I'm doing right now with my buffing machine. The 110 just sits there, and I get shocked once in a while, so maybe I should ground the... Uh, definitely do that, and I'd, I'd be looking at for cracked wires. If I had a grinder that did that, it was a 110 grinder, but mm -hmm. when I d turned it over and opened everything up, you know, all the installations cracked because it's old and, and yeah. it was just uh, bleeding over the frame. So you start looking for cracked wires on 110. But these bleed from the frequency. I mean, it's it's an odd... There, it's a, It this, induces voltage into the metal yeah, around it. Yeah, it's really weird. It, uh, they're strange, but, but they're cool. Yeah, a lot of these older machines you'll find they don't even have a ground ground wire on them. Yeah. They, were, they were just wired, three hot wires and that's it. I have not run across one yet that it hurt grounding it. Mm. So um, they might be out there that there'd be a problem, but I've, I've, I've grounded just anywhere. You're right, John. Uh, Dan, you had a question? Uh, why did you choose to stick with a single phase on your bandsaw rather than a phase converter? Uh, the the oh. bandsaw, is on the rotary phase converter. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that's yeah. seven and a half horsepower. So a seven and a half horsepower variable frequency drive would be like crazy yeah, expensive. Probably. Yeah, that'd be, it cost as much as the bandsaw did. Well, for that me, bandsaw. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah. <laughs> Maybe not that bandsaw. But, <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, they get really pricey when you get above five horsepower. So I think five horsepower is probably the cutoff for practical. Then you really are starting to talk about buying a rotary phase converter for it. And even they're not, you know, they're not cheap. So unless you make it yourself, that's another. Yeah, that's, so another, that's another. That's another. That's another adventure. <laughs> I have a 110 with reverse frequency converter. 110 in. 110. What's yeah, what's. What's one? Is it one ten in, one ten out? No, yeah, it's two twenty out. Yeah, that's yeah. You can get a phase converter. In fact, the one that's uh, that Vern brought in is is one ten out, ten in, two twenty out. It's the two twenty out that we were talking about. You, you, the motor has to be a two twenty motor. I run the three phase automatic model ninety. Yeah. One ten converter. Right. Right. But if you look at the motor, look at your motor tag, I'll bet it says it's a 220 motor. I, I think your phase converter is giving you the 220. I, that's what I'm, I'm I have betting. A, I have a, a 110 inverter that takes 110 power in and then converts it to 223 phase on the, out, uh, on the output side. So that's, that's, I'll have to look at yeah, that's pretty, it's, they're there, they're out there. They're, they're not as common as the 220 ones. And they're a little bit pricier too. Yes, they are. Why would you have a 220 converter to a 220 motor? Why have a converter other than variable frequency? Phase. I had to do it around the machine. And yeah. Phase. It's the phase issue to generate that third leg. So remember, you're talking. So there's 110. Yeah. Right. There's 220. Right. And here's three phase. So when you you need to generate that third phase, and that's what an inverter does, is it takes the inverter does two things. It converts, and for yours, it steps up the voltage and then it generates a third leg. So that it gets you that three phase power. Of the other, you know, the other ones, the two toys, it'll take the two in and generate the third. But in yours, it's going in at one and generating three, so. I do that reverse right on it. I don't have to rewire it. No, right. no, you don't have to do anything. So you can just flip a switch and go to reverse on yeah. it. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, the VFDs have a have a. Instead of running a three wire circuit like you got there, you'd run a four wire. One yeah. Would be your bonding wire. Yeah. If I if I was going to run this machine wire. with this, I would do a couple things. I would put this this control unit in the cabinet down here, protect it from dust, mount the switch, and I'd run a four wire, 
and it doesn't have to be heavy for 8 amp. I know this sounds too light, but the book says 8, what did I say, 16 or 18 gauge? It was light. Yeah, but I, I'd probably run the, either uh, 14, maybe 14 gauge wire just because I, I like to have have enough wire. <laughs> All right. Any anything else? Well, if you think of anything or you need help, John's available most of the time. And you're available all the time. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, guys. That's it.